Just a quick content warning. We briefly make mention of suicide, so if this is a sensitive topic for you, please listen with care. Hello and welcome to Criminality, the podcast where we know that loving reality isn't a crime, even though everyone involved in reality has a criminal con connection. Rebecca, how are you doing? That's why we're here. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really good, thanks. I appreciate it. Rebecca, you had a very big week this week, and as a lover of Bravo, lover of all things reality. Um, I can't wait for you to share with everyone uh, so we can kind of live through you, vicariously through what you've already done. Yes. Okay. It is It is kind of a big deal. Um, it's a huge deal. I mean, it's such a big deal that I asked you to fly in for a day to join me. Um, yes. So months and months ago, I don't remember if it was through Instagram or an email. I don't know where I saw it, but I saw like a Bravo fan's Tell us why you should be in the audience for Watch What Happens Live when we start taping again. Right. And I just took to my laptop and clicked away all the many reasons. <laughs> I sent pictures of me in my housewife mugshot shirt. I told them about criminality. And I forgot about it, of course, because once I do something, right. it's it's over. It's over. Like it never happened. And then I guess I don't know when it was, but like a week, a little more than a week ago, I got this email that. Not only did I get chosen, they were filming in a couple of days. I had two tickets, myself plus one, and I had to let them know like immediately or they move on to the next person. And it all felt very intense. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like on a scale of one to ten, I'm hovering around a seven, eight usually. So like, right. this was like pushing me up and over the ten. So then I start stressing about who am I going to ask? You know, I've got right. my mom. I've got you. I've got really good friend Rachel who loves Bravo with me. And then a cousin in San Diego. And then just knowing like it's such a coveted event in New York City, like it's talked about how you can't get right. tickets to it, that I'm thinking, you know, how, how am I ever going to like choose somebody and who am I going to bring? But I ask you first because I just thought this would be such a cool thing to Thank share you. together. Yeah, you're welcome. Right. And of course, it's also a really big ask to ask you to fly to New York. So you couldn't do it. Not surprisingly, school, kids, family, life, work. So I'm like, okay, Melissa's off down to friend and mom. And I decide, you know what? I'm going to ask my mom. <laughs> my mom loves Andy Cohen. She listens to Sirius XM, like Andy Radio That's or whatever. Amazing. She loves them. She loves most of the housewives. And this is going to be perfect. So I text my mom, do you want to be in the audience of Watch What Happens slash Bravo? I got selected to be in the audience. And she writes back, no way. No exclamation point. No. So I'm like, well, does she mean no way? Or does she mean no way? Right. And then so I clarify, you don't want to? And she just writes it back, no. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll ask someone else. I thought you enjoyed Andy. And she said, I do, but I wouldn't be comfortable being there. And Melissa, can I just say, moms have good instincts. Uh, we did play a game called, would it make you horny? And the idea of me and my mom playing it together I mean, I think she could have like risen to the occasion, but like, I don't know what but she was imagining. That? <laughs> I didn't really need to be there. And let me just tell you, Melissa, just we're jumping ahead, but I was definitely the oldest person there or among. Yeah. So, and I don't think I looked out of place particularly, but these people no. were young. So I think my mom would have just been like, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Barbara's out, Melissa's out, cousin from San Diego, can't quite fly across the country. So my dear friend Rachel did join me and we had an absolute blast. Um, so the good stuff, it's really, really fun to go. Right. It's so fun to see how it all happens. The set is super tiny. How many people are in the audience? It was really small. And I don't know if that's normal right. or post COVID, but I would say there were only, there were less than 20 of us. Oh, wow. Um, and so we, we line up outside and we're waiting and Andy pulls up in his car, a car lets him out and he waves to everybody and like, just the energy kind of like picks up and we're all like, oh my gosh. And you're just seeing him and you're just like, ah, and right. we still don't know who the guests will be. So we get ushered in by the kind of show assistant who's there to like hype you up. Right. And she leads us to this room that's on a different floor from the studio hmm. and there's a bar and we get drink tickets and it's uh, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So <laughs> people are having their drinks and there's a strobe light and we're dancing and there's a cardboard cutout of Andy and you take a picture with it and it's, there's cocktail napkins. I stole one. Yeah, I mean, of course. I took one. They were there for taking. Right. I don't think it was like against the rules. And it was just like, oh, it was fun. Right. It's like extroverted fun. 
because it's the daytime. And you have to practice cheering. And she's like, I'm going to do this and you're going to clap, you know, the whole thing. Right. So then we get ushered into the set, which is gorgeous. You know, we've all seen Watch What Happens Live and just seeing the iconic memorabilia around his space. It was fun. It was so fun. So the bunny was there in the cellophane wrap. Mm. Love it. We find out that the guests are Melissa McCarthy and Chelsea Handler. Amazing. Right. Comedic heavyweights, amazing actors and and comedians, but they're virtual. So that was sad because Andy was there on set, but they're like zoomed in on the TVs. And super bummer, right after us, the next group came in to record and they got Sarah Paulson in person and Lisa Rinna in person. I so can't. look, we can't have everything. I'm trying not to complain. I feel so grateful that I got to go. Um, there was also a Q&A with Andy before the show starts so people oh, wow. can ask questions. And he was uh, pleasant and nice, but definitely not like, let's all take selfies. Like, it's very professional business. Mm-hmm. Like, he does these a couple times a day. You know, it's a job. Right. Um, but he was lovely. And he did say the Roni reunion is absolutely happening. It's just been a nightmare of schedules. And that's the only delay. And that was last Tuesday. And then, of course, since then, it is Ooh. officially not happening. So I was like, what? Because I took him at his word. I mean, he's like, it's literally just their schedules. It's just been a nightmare. So I don't obviously believe that anymore because there's no yeah. way they can't work out schedules. So yeah. Yeah. it's their job to uh, do it's these their things. Job. They obviously don't want to have one. And I have thoughts on that. And I think it's really a bad precedent. Um, I don't care yeah. how bad the season was. I think they all need to get up there and talk about it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a good strategy. I think we were talking about this, like leaving people wanting more. Yeah, like, with we'll be season. so ready for Roni when it comes on. But um, I don't know. I think it warrants a reunion. Yeah, it'll just be people not doing reunions. It's like when one person learned that you could walk off stage. Now everybody walks off stage. That's right. like the big thing. So Right, right, right. No thanks. Not interested. Yeah, no thanks. So it was really, really cool. And then I was exhausted. I was just so tired from the like – being on and clapping on demand and like yeah. screaming. Um, but it was really fun. It was yeah. really just cool to, to see it all happen. So. Yeah. In my head, I absolutely think it would be the most fun, but I would I would just bring a pillow because I could not stay up after that. It's too much excitement no, and stuff. and so much excitement and energy. And um, yeah, I think I passed out really early that night. I might have even had to record that night. And it went really – I was so wrecked. I could barely speak. But um, yeah. very fun. There is a That's tiny awesome. clip of me waving. I will um, I will grab it from the I, – I meant to do this. I'll post it on social because it's, like, oh, ridiculous. It's, like <laughs> – Double hands like <laughs> Tina Fey. Definitely. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's yeah. so exciting. Yeah, I'm, it was. I'm excited for you. Um, so this week – The episode we're doing is reality related, of course, but uh, I kind of gave, I I definitely gave three clues. And my three clues were SNL, Assistant, Mm -hmm. and Mullet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Google search, just so you know, gave me nothing. Nothing. I I Googled it because I got so curious and I I can't figure this one out. So I didn't dig through the Google results. I Googled and was just like, I have no idea. Just sketches came up and I, I didn't know. Yeah. So if I were to tell you that... If I were to mention Joe Dirt, would that help at all? Is that well? This that's um, yeah, that's a character. That's, that's Dana Carvey, David Spade. No, it's it. da- <laughs> <laughs> actually they are transposable. They are, and that actually comes up a little bit later. So n- no okay. worries there. You're good. I mean, in a lineup, that'd be like I could get them, but yeah. they could they could stand in for each other. They could stand in for each other. Okay, sure. so it means a little more to me. Keep going. So, okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll get into the episode. But yes, this week we are discussing David Spade. And if you haven't heard this story, it is wild. I wild, definitely haven't. Wild, wild, I'm so excited because I thought if she gets the mullet and then gets to Joe Dirt, then she'll figure it out. That was my mullet I don't even clue. know that I've seen a Joe Dirt sketch. Okay, it was a movie. I don't think it was oh. ever a sketch. Um, wow. Okay. You were about to learn a lot today. So. I can't wait. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, now I feel a lot more pressure because you don't know what's coming next. So, Rebecca, back in 2017, David Spade walks into his home after a few days of being away. He notices the blinds in his house are halfway opened in the living room. And he thinks it's weird, but he knows a lot of people have been working in and out. He's doing renovations on his home. And so he's, you know, asking like, hey, did you guys do this? 
nobody says they've seen anything. So they all say, yeah, no, we didn't touch your blinds, don't know what's happening. And so he kind of shrugs it off, but he can't help but think that like someone's been going through his house and he doesn't know who. So before he goes to bed that night, he goes into his bathroom to grab this shotgun he has to bring with him after, you know, like whenever he goes to sleep. So as he goes in to get the shotgun that stays by his safe, he notices the safe is no longer there. Oh. Someone, yeah, someone's taken it and gotten away with about $80,000 in goods. Even his mom's wedding ring, like real, I hate whenever that happens. Like it's so sad. That happened in another one of our stories. Yeah. Um, the bling ring one. Someone lost yeah. their, like a family heirloom. That's so sad. Super sad. And so back in 2017, though, when this happened, other stars actually had break-ins. Uh, Nicki Minaj, Alanis Morissette, and Scott Disick. They all had break-ins as well. And while this would have been more than enough to shake someone up, this isn't the first time David's been victim of a crime. Hmm. The story we're talking about this week is much more scary and more personal. Everybody lives, but it's wild. So it's no idea. No idea. Okay, no. I learned this story um, maybe two years ago when I uh, listened to his audiobook. I was painting and I was like, I need a comedian audiobook. That'll help. And it really did. I got through several rooms, but um, nice. it's, it's quite intense. Okay. So when you hear the name David Spade, you might think of, you know, him being a comedian, buddy of Chris Farley and Joe Dirt. There's your mullet. Okay. Um, and reality TV might not come to mind. But this summer, David took on being a co-host of sorts on Bachelor in Paradise after the exit of Chris Harrison. So right, how, right, right, right. That's how I got to him. sneak this one in. Yes, he was so good. He joined Titus Burgess and Lance Bass on this season. And in my opinion, and like Rebecca was saying, he was a really great addition. Um, a, one person even called him Dave Chappelle, but he's able to like go with the jokes. He's very self-deprecating, mm -hmm. sarcastic, which is truly my love language. That kind of humor is is my thing. And so while some people think, you know, this comedian coming onto this island just to dump on people he doesn't actually know, it's kind of weird. He's actually been a very longtime viewer of The Bachelor. And I during yeah various runs of his talk show, he's had different guests there, you know, different uh, contestants. He used to do a lot. I don't know if he still does, Instagram stories like of him talking as he's on The Bachelor while watching The Bachelor, kind of making jokes throughout. Yeah. And so he had, you know, Chris Harrison on the show, all of that. He's very close to Bachelor Nation, very Bachelor Nation adjacent. And they kind of accept him because it is this like big name. It's like a Jerry O'Connell with Bravo. Like we love having him, right? Yes. It's just this person that you're like, you don't belong here, but we like you here. Great. Thanks for being here. And it's like a form of flattery too. the imitation when a comedian does it. If it's done in the right way, it feels like they're on the same team. They're not like totally roasting. It's like somewhere nice in the middle. Right. And him being on there, I think, was a good nod to that, that he's like having a good time with it. An he knows they're fan. having a good time with it. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just it would have been weird if it was just like Anthony Jeselnik or somebody who just roasts yeah. people. He like really, really liked this show. Yeah. So I think it was a really good uh, call on ABC's part. So beyond that, David currently has some gig on Netflix where he hosts like after parties of different okay. shows. Um, so one of them is The Circle, which The Circle just keeps pumping out new seasons of stuff. So he does like an after show kind of thing for them. And while he doesn't no, you know, isn't known for reality. He does seem to understand the appeal of reality. And he even was like really big into the Joe Dirt thing or not Joe Dirt, uh, Joe Exotic. People thought he should play Joe oh, Exotic. Yeah, that would have been good. Yeah. So he had some of those people on his show. So he gets like this whole, I mean, I know that's not reality, but it's docu and whatever. Scripted. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. halfway there in that picture. He, he <laughs> is. <laughs> So before David was a part of Batch Nation, he was really just a scrawny kid that was actually born a preemie and was unable to have any food or drink anything other than goat's milk for the first year of his life. Like he was oh. very sick. It took a while for his parents to figure out what was going on. Um, at the age of four, his dad decided to move this family. They lived in Michigan to move them to Arizona. 
And David jokes in his book that there was literally no reason for the family to move to Arizona other than his dad wanted to cheat on his mom in a new state. His dad (laughs) was the worst. He's like, he ran out of people in Michigan, so we had to go somewhere else for him to do that. He's truly the worst. When they get to Arizona, his dad actually leaves his mom, and she has no job. She has three boys whose initials coincidentally spelled bad, Brian, Andy, (laughs) and David. And if you recognize the name Andy Spade, that's because he's that Andy Spade. Yes. Right? Kate Spade's husband. husband. I think they they were separated at the time she yeah. passed, or they may have been divorced at that point. Yeah. That family has a lot of, like, inter-famous connections because they're – they have a famous niece, too, that I'm forgetting, like a mm. young actress who I remember popping up in the headlines. Karen. I have to Google that. Yeah. Yeah. So back to David's childhood, things were sort of wild and chaotic growing up in Arizona with this mom who's working all the time to keep Mm -hmm. her kids fed and housed, and his dad would kind of show up from time to time, never for very long, and then he'd be back out of their lives for months and years at a time. Nice. Yeah, so David and his brothers were definition latchkey kids. This quote uh, from The Hollywood Reporter is going to blow your mind when you think he's just in his 50s, so this wasn't that long ago, um, (laughs) of, of him describing this time in his life. And he said, quote, When we were 8, 10, and 12... My mom was really an on-the-go 70s woman. My dad scrammed. So when you're a single mom in Arizona, we all had guns because we're from Arizona. So she would take us on the way to work to the end of the desert, and I had a rifle, Andy had a pistol, Brian had a shotgun. We had a lunch, a canteen, and back teen in case everything went wrong. And then she would pick us up seven miles away at the Chevron station when she was off work. We had a quarter to call her if there were any problems, but the payphone was at the Chevron, so we had to at least get there. So basically, there's these boys. I have (laughs) never heard of anything like this. This Arizona. There's these boys in the desert walking seven miles. She's like, I don't know what to do with these kids. They all have their firearms, and they're just like shooting cactus and stuff on a seven-mile walk. It's Lord of the Flies, like 70s Arizona edition. Right? It is... Wild. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like one wouldn't of, be allowed today. No, no. But it is just fascinating to me that she's like, here's a quarter. If anything yeah. happens, call me. But you got to get seven miles up the road to even call me. So equipping them also with like weaponry and the quarter. It's just like surely nothing could go wrong. What could no, go wrong? She gave him back teen just in case. <laughs> She was trying, but I feel terrible for her. I mean, she's trying to raise these three boys. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So David grows up somehow. He ends up going to college at Arizona State and realizes, you know, he's kind of a funny guy. He wasn't really loving college, but he was loving the experience of meeting these new people and uh, realized that he really wanted to try his hand at comedy. And so he decides to take it more seriously, and he starts out in comedy clubs in Arizona. Eventually, though, he makes his way to L.A. where he's working in clubs as much as possible. And in 1987, he's performing at the Improv in L.A. when a casting agent sees his act filled with this self-deprecation and sarcasm. And they end up offering him a role in Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol. Nice. Yeah, I don't have anything to say about that. I never made it that far in the Police Academy series. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's great. He continues on with stand-up in and around L.A., and then in 1990, he lands a coveted spot in the 1990 season of SNL. So Dennis Miller had happened to see one of his sets, and he introduces him to Lorne Michaels, and that's where he actually comes on to SNL originally as a writer, which he was kind of like, I'm not really a writer, I'm not really... An actor, I just, you know, make fun of myself, basically. So in this season, here's this cast. You ready? Okay. Dana Carvey, Phil Hartman, Jan Hooks, Dennis Miller, who was a new hire that year. Wow. Mike Myers and Kevin Nealon. Dang. Keep going. It was also starring. They kind of had it set up in three things. So that was the first group. Group B was uh, Chris Farley, Tim Meadows. Jeez. Chris Rock and Julia Sweeney. And the featured players were A. Whitney Brown, who I am not familiar with, Al Franken, Adam Sandler, and David State. David Spade. I, 
I mean, these are some of the the most iconic of all time, all right? in one place. It's crazy. A total powerhouse season, and also Rob Schneider was there. So David said in these first seasons, he knew, you know, they're all competing for the same spots to get time on the show. Right. And so he really focused on writing during that time because obviously if you write the sketch, you're more likely to be in the sketch. But David said early on, many of the things he actually wrote for himself ended up being used by his gop- doppelganger. Dana Carvey. Yeah. Which is probably, I'm going to say that's why I mixed them up. A hundred percent. I knew you were going there and you knew this history. So got it. Of course, of course. So SNL, though, would be where he would make some of the greatest relationships in his life. These were the seasons that really, to me, defined SNL and really my Mm -hmm. love of all things comedy. Do you remember, like, do you have favorites during this time? Uh, I bet if you name some sketches and like some recurring characters, I would know them. But no. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, all that you remember, like, um, well, Dana Carvey did uh, Church Lady. Oh, of um, course. Yeah. Chris Farley did everything. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think, did you say Mike Myers was on? Mike Myers. Yeah. So Wayne's World would have come around this time. And yep. that was like an obsession for me and my brother. Right. Yeah, there's just so many things that you know, even in pop culture, have come yes. from this time on SNL. Right. So during this time on SNL, David created the iconic bye bye character that people still repeat today, right? Maybe you don't even know where it came from, but that was like his thing on the plane. I want to say, it wasn't Heather Locklear, who was the blonde Helen, I want to say Helen Chapel. that's me going back to Wings, uh, Helen Mad Hunt. About You Hunt. Hunt. Thank you. Yeah. That was like the really, really big one that really kind of pushed him over the edge and people started noticing him. Okay. And so he said, you know, it was really hard to get his footing on this show. And he once joked that he would be in the middle of writing a sketch, you know, in the office late at night on a legal pad. And then he would hear Adam Sandler tuning his guitar and he would just throw away a sketch because he just knew, you know, whatever Adam Sandler's doing music, it's over for you. You're, you're yeah. not going to get on. Oh, man. So SNL is known for being really friendly. Just kidding. It's known for being very super cutthroat. And he knew he needed something that would work to get a recurring character. And he did do the bye bye thing, but really it only had legs for so long. You can only do that so long. That's when he starts Hollywood Minute on SNL. And people really loved it. It's David really go like he said that he was being goaded by the writers and different people to just take on these big celebrities and make these jokes about, you know, whatever's going on in pop culture and stuff that week. It's very in in our vein, I think, of like stuff we enjoy and the jokes yeah, and the to- hot back. topics. Yeah. And watch some. Yeah, there's some good ones. And then came his infamous Eddie Murphy joke. Are you familiar with his Eddie Murphy feud? Mm, I mean, I bet I'll remember when you say it, but I, I don't remember right now. Yeah, it was uh, pretty serious. Did he really tick Eddie Murphy off? That oh. sounds oof. That sounds like something you don't want to do. So yeah, one night on the Hollywood Minute, he says in between several jokes, he's done five, he does this one, and then there's eight more. So okay. just kind of a joke that he makes in there. He ends up, you know, he said, I noticed that a few of his films have flopped. And so I thought, you know, this would be a good joke. So he says, hey, look, kids, a falling star, make a wish. And up pops a picture of Eddie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I that's lighthearted to me, but I guess maybe not Eddie to Murphy's Eddie Murphy. Ego couldn't take that one. Ooh. Yeah, his girl likes to party all the time, but she does not like to uh, <laughs> hear about his falling star. So David doesn't think anything about this, right? He's roasting everybody. And it's right. one of several jokes. And he said, you know, Eddie's such a big star. Like, I didn't even think he'd hear about it. You know, yeah. who cares what he has to say about him? So then on Monday, David gets a call at SNL from Eddie Murphy. Ooh. And he quickly tells the person that takes the call, say, I'm not there. Say, I'm busy. <laughs> and the, so, you know, they hang up. And Eddie calls again. And so David says, come up with another excuse. You know, whatever. I'm not here. I can't take it. So Eddie hangs up, calls a third time. This time, David says, hey, tell him I'm in a meeting and I'll call him back. And the person who answers the phone said, he knows that this is the time they do meet the guest at six o'clock. 
and it's always running late, so there's no way you're in a meeting because he oh, knows you know you can't how it outsmart works. Eddie Murphy on no. SNL protocol, right? And so oh. the person that answers the phone, you know, tells him this, and he said, "If you don't take his call, he's coming up here now to beat the crap out of you." Take the call. Crap the wasn't call. the word used. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was lots of other letters, language, and mm-hmm. language, and you know, you color paint the picture. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So he ends up getting on the phone with him and he like says, you have no right to do this. Um, You know, this is not what you should do. I'm from the show, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, he's totally shocked. He feels terrible because he thought it was a very, you know, innocent joke. Yeah, almost like a throwaway, like. Totally, yeah, in yeah. the grand scheme of the things that he was saying, this was nothing. Yeah. And he said, you know, to me, he's such a big star. This can't touch him. Like, sure, he might have had a few movies that flop, but he's still Eddie Murphy. Everyone right. knows Eddie Murphy. So anyway, because I love Resolution, though, in 2011, the two ended up running into each other. David apologized. Eddie accepted. All is well oh, good. in this oh, good. Yeah, but it was just, oh, can you imagine taking on Eddie Murphy? Well, he obviously did not take him on. My Eddie stomach Murphy hurts. took on him. <laughs> Just thinking about it, yeah. So back to Saturday Night Live, uh, Lauren Michaels sees this natural chemistry between David and Chris Farley, and they're so opposite in their delivery. <laughs> David yeah. is more, I wouldn't say an intellectual comedian, but he's more talk. Chris Farley's very physical. Mm-hmm. Together, they are hilarious. Yes. And so that's whenever Lauren decides to produced two different buddy comedies with uh, Chris Farley and David Spade. Um, There was a third one in the works, but unfortunately, Chris Farley Mm -hmm. passed away in 1997. Can I tell you, I very much remember, well, I graduated in 2001, but I remember in 1997 crying at school, being so Mm -hmm. upset that Chris Farley died. Oh, Melissa. That's so sad that I was like 15 years old, so into SNL. That's not sad. That's like, that's super cool. Yeah, I loved it. I really did like um, when the Chris Farley Saturday Night Live, I guess it must have been a DVD. That was the first DVD I ever owned, like his best of. I loved it. Yeah. So I guess I won't ask you where you were whenever Chris Farley died. I Yeah. I mean, I obviously remember when that happened. You mentioned graduating in 01. I graduated in 97. So I was a senior in high school. Okay. Um, so now everybody knows how old I am. Yeah. It's fine. It's just got <laughs> really warm in here. Um, but yeah, it was tragic. It was awful. Terrible. Yeah. Super, super sad. So these two movies, though, really are two of my favorites, uh, Tommy Boy and Black Sheep. Okay. They're great. <laughs> I don't want to have my daughter watch them because I don't know if you didn't watch them at the time, if you could find them as appealing. Endearing. Yeah. yeah. I don't wonder how they aged. I don't know. Not great. I'm, I'm not. certain it didn't age great. Um, but to me, they're really just classics. And David really plays the same character in both of these. Chris really plays the same character in both of these. But you love them together and it's so fun. So by 1995, though, David is considering leaving SNL, but Lauren asks him, you know, can you just stay on one more year while we do this transition with new people? Lots of people are leaving. So that year, the new people coming in were Sherry O'Terry, mm. Molly Shannon, oh. and Will Ferrell. Well, Maybe you've yeah, heard of them. Yeah, must be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, those three. Right. So during this last year, he ended up having a weekly segment called Spade in America, it's really the Hollywood Minute, but they did it weekly. So it was part of um, part of Weekend Update, really, was his okay. whole Spade in America thing. Okay. So then in 1996, David leaves SNL. It's kind of a big risk um, because he was never really the starring guy. He was kind of the buddy and everything. Um, but he's worked in movies now, and he loves doing stand-up, so he has a little bit of notoriety at this point. He's offered roles in lots of things, but he ends up just taking this one huge role as David Finch in Just Shoot Me. Did you ever watch Just Shoot Me? Mm-mm, yeah, it wasn't one that was really on my radar. I knew people that really liked it, but it just felt a little older for me for some reason. Yeah. Because I'm really young. I graduated <laughs> in 2001. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that. I didn't know if it would be it. your thing. Is that your thing? It's a little older. It's, I'm sure it was my just demographic kidding. and I just totally I'm missed totally it. I'm totally kidding. I'm oh. kidding. Kidding. So he ends up doing this from 1997 to 2003, which is great to come off of SNL. We yeah, see these people run. sometimes come off and it's, you never see them again, which is yeah. always kind of sad. So he, it wouldn't be the only long running TV show he was on. He was also on Rules of Engagement. 
which I remember the name, never saw it. Yeah. I can picture him in a lot of TV shows now that I think about it. Right? And I call that one the one with Putty from Seinfeld because I didn't know anybody else in that show. And that's another one I never watched but, like, knew it was on. Sure. I feel like it was age appropriate, but I still didn't watch it. (laughs) And uh, Eight Simple Rules, uh, which he came on after the death of John Ritter. He was – I can't remember what his spot was. I watched that show when John Ritter was on. I did not – yeah, I loved John Ritter. I got to see um, Washington, D.C., maybe my senior year, a play with him and um, the Fonz, uh, Henry Winkler. They mm-hmm. were in a play, and it was That's one of the cool. coolest things ever. Yeah. Yeah. So back to not me. Um, but basically, really, if there is a role for a sarcastic but lovable jerk, mm-hmm. David Spade is your guy. Mm-hmm. But in 2001... That changes when Adam Sandler offers David a starring role in Joe Dirt. I know this movie is so ridiculous. Did you – you've never watched it. It doesn't seem – No, but I love Adam Sandler movies. I didn't even know about this one. You can tell this is a New York, Florida thing because this was like a little too close to home at times watching this movie. (laughs) (laughs) I'm related to some Joe Dirts. I am a Joe Dirt. It's okay. Wait, so like what year-ish are we? 2001. Okay. There was a lot going on in 2001. Yeah, I just, there's just some pockets of time I can't account for where Mm -hmm. like, or or I'll know something really, I'll go really deep and specific into something, but then I'll miss an entirely other part of pop culture or the world. Right. I guess that year was one of them. I don't know. I don't remember this. Yeah, that's okay. I think that (laughs) is never a strike against you. It's a strike against me for my Mm. love of it. It's super ridiculous. It's good for a few laughs. And I read the wiki description because I'm like, I don't really remember everything that was going on. The premise. (laughs) Yeah. the Thank you. So I looked for like a little refresher to either tell you or just to refresh myself. And it was basically a a guy who had the back of his head open and his parents sewed in a mullet. So the head would be covered. And that's why he always had a mullet. And then he also carried around an asteroid, but was actually a big thing of poo that came from, I think, an airplane. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I tell you, you didn't miss anything, you didn't miss anything. Aspiring writers take heart. I mean, any idea, there are no bad ideas, apparently. This got made. This got made, and it became a cult hit, sure, oddly I'm enough. Sure. Yeah. So, anyway, it's a Happy Madison production, as I said, uh, you know. Adam Sandler is producing it. Um, It teams David up with SNL alum Dennis Miller, as well as Christopher Walken for some reason. And yeah, the it did okay in the box office, but it really, like I was saying, had a huge cult following. They even made a second movie in 2015. Now here's where I should be embarrassed, Rebecca. (laughs) It debuted on Crackle, and my husband and I watched it the day it debuted. On yeah, in, crackle. T- in 2015, Melissa should know better. <laughs> yeah. 2001, Melissa. She forgive was young. Bulk. Yeah, she, yeah. <laughs> she was young. She had her whole life ahead of her. 2015, Melissa's like, I'm so glad we have crackle for no reason on our phone, on our TV. We should watch this. And, and? I enjoyed it. I yeah, enjoyed okay, it. I was waiting for it. <laughs> no, that's the worst part. No regrets. So, yeah, very ridiculous, but it's, it's a funny, dumb, stupid thing you don't have to think too much about. And you sure. know we love that. Absolutely. But Joe Dirt would prove to be incredibly important to both David Spade and to our story. I'm in it now. At the time our story takes place, David is editing the movie Joe Dirt with the help of his assistant named Skippy. Skippy is not his Christian name. It's David Warren Malloy. But David was like, hey, there's two of us. Do you have a nickname? (laughs) And he was like, Skippy. So he became Skippy. Match. At this point, David's known him for about five years. He's been his assistant for about three. Um, He's a pretty big guy. He's 6'3", about 300 pounds. And David, yeah, David's like 5'7". I don't know how much he weighs, but a buck 50. Slim guy. Yeah. Yeah, be beyond what he could weigh. Yeah. So David and Skippy are buddies. But Skippy really always wanted a career in Hollywood. So he's like Hollywood adjacent. He um, There was one story in his book where he talked about getting offers to get baseball tickets, I believe. Um, like the studios would offer David and he was like, well, if they give you that, they want something in return. So he would always decline. And so one day, I guess he went to say he wanted to get the tickets 
And they were like, yeah, we've been giving them to you. But in fact, Skippy had been the one taking these tickets all along and David didn't know. So oh. his assistant's been going to all these games. Maybe not a good idea here, Skippy, um, you know, doing this and your boss not knowing. But David was like, he was my friend. He was doing a good job. I told him it was a dumb thing to do, but don't do it again. Yeah. Yeah. It's shady, though. Shady for sure. So, and like how easily somebody could figure that out that you've like been to these games. That's like a lot of lying you have to do to not well, accidentally right. screw that up. Yeah. And that says a lot. Like if you're not afraid of that potential repercussion, it's a certain kind of person. So, yeah. So Skippy was performing uh, stand up around the area and is really just looking for his big break. And so while David and Skippy are editing Joe Dirt, he looks at the screen, Kevin Nealon's in this part, and he says something to the effect of, really angrily, Kevin Nealon stole my effing part. Again, more colorful language. So to back it up just a little bit, in Joe Dirt, Kevin Nealon has this small role as a greasy mechanic. The role is so small, it's even uncredited. Like, Kevin Nealon's just in there for a few minutes. Apparently, though, when David was talking to Adam about this movie and different parts, he thought, you know, I could give this part to my buddy Skippy. He didn't tell Adam that, but he just kind of thought that. So unfortunately for Skippy, after David's mentioned it to Skippy, like, hey, I want to put you in this part in the movie, Adam Sandler actually calls David and is like, you know, this part of the mechanic, wouldn't it be fun if Kevin Nealon did that? And David was like, yeah, Kevin Nealon's great. Let's do it, you know? And in his mind, he's like, Adam's financing the movie. He's not asked me for anything. If he wants Kevin Nealon to have yeah. his part, Kevin Nealon can have his part. So he yeah. tells that to Skippy. And he wasn't happy, but they kind of move forward from that. So in this conversation, when Skippy's saying, you know, Kevin Nealon stole my part, David's saying, no, remember, that's not what happened. You know, Adam didn't screw you over. He was yelling about that. Kevin didn't steal your role. It just didn't work out. And this kind of happens. Right. So, David, this is just life in Hollywood, right? You think you have a part, you lose a part. It yeah. just is what it is. But Skippy is so upset that night. He ends up leaving, and David kind of thinks it's the end of it. You know, he keeps bringing it up, thought maybe I won't have him along for editing anymore. You know, I don't want to upset him. And they decide to get together the next day. So David goes to sleep that night around midnight, and at 6 a.m., he wakes up because he said he feels like somebody's looking at him. You know oh, that feeling? Yes. yes. And somebody was. He oh, looks into his door frame. Skippy. Skippy. Skippy dippy. Skippy is standing in the door frame with his hand behind his back. One of his hands is behind his back. And so David says, you know, I'm barely awake and I know something's not right. And he says, you know, hey, what are you doing here? And Skippy says, oh, um, the alarm company called me. The alarm was going off. And David was like, you know, you know, in his mind, like he's the assistant. He would have that information. And David goes to tell him, hey, I didn't set the alarm that night. And that's when Skippy punches him in the face and tases him with a stun gun, which is what oh, he had behind his back. My gosh. I'm so excited. I'm blowing your mind with this story. It's crazy. Does David have the gun that he usually sleeps with next to him? Or was that later? You're about to find out. That okay. was a different story. He got robbed before. Well, I know, but I remember thing. him going for the oh. gun that he usually has. Like, was that? Yeah. Was You'll that? You'll find a, out. Okay, okay. It's okay. coming. Okay. It's coming. Yikes. So, yeah. And so he says, you know, I've been tased. I don't think it's at full power because he's still able to, like, get up and move around. Okay. So he's getting hit over and over by this six foot three, 300 pound oh, yeah. dude. Not a fair And fight. that was his friend an hour ago, you know? Yikes. And so he says he flips over his bed, gets on his feet, realizes he's bleeding, and he realizes the pokey thing on the sides of the stun gun has just been scratching him as he's going for him. Ouch. Yeah. He's able to break away, and he runs off into the driveway. He goes for the gate and realizes the gate has a code. There's no way I'm going to be able to punch this code in and get out. So then he goes back trying to get away from Skippy. So this whole house, you know, he's got this, the huge Hollywood Yeah, gates. I can picture this. Yeah. Why Why would he not be able to do that? Because it would take too long? Yeah, it would take too long. for. I mean, the guy's just on him. He's like, he's okay. a big guy, but I've never seen him like this. He is just hounding me. Oh so at some gosh. point, I shouldn't say he was at the gate, but he's realizing like, that's it's, not an option. Got it. He's going to okay. get me. 
Sorry, I didn't explain that well. He realizes, so they're in the driveway now and now they're fighting and he's realizing like, I have to get away from him to call somebody or he's going to kill me. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he knocks the taser out of his hand and he heads for the door, the front door, which I guess Skippy left open whenever he came in that night. And he said, as soon as he turned around to slam it, to close it, to lock it, he hit the door. Like he had no time, just a miracle that he was able to even lock the door. So this is when David runs to his room, flies under his bed and grabs his shotgun. He realizes I'm going to have to shoot my friend. And, you know, this is my friend for years. And now he's literally trying to kill me. So he goes into the bathroom, calls 911. And they say, hey, go out in the alley. So I don't really know the setup of his house, but they're saying go in the alley and wait for police. He's like, absolutely not. The last time I saw him, he was outside. I'm not doing it. Yeah. And so he realizes when he's standing there that everything's wearing off, like the stun gun, you know, is wearing off. His adrenaline is wearing off. Uh He realizes he's bleeding and he's like, I'm going to pass out. Like I'm just freaking out. And he's like, nobody's going to find me. I'm going to, he's going to come in here and finish me off. So he says, you know, he grabs his shotgun and says at the door, because he thinks he could be inside. He says, first, I'm going to shoot you in the leg. Then I'm going to shoot you in the face. Like he's trying to warn this person who's been his friend, like, yeah, you got to get out of here. Like, I'm doing everything I can not to actually do this. Yeah. Can you imagine this <laughs> for no, a second? No, I cannot. Any, pick a friend and this going on and what do you do? I mean, I think he's doing everything right so far. Yeah, I think he's doing everything he could. He clearly really does care about this guy and I does know. not want this to happen. Of course. So he ends up coming out with this gun Skippy's not there. He's walking by windows, not seeing him, but he's just like, there's a lot of windows in my house. He says it in a funny way. He's like, there's a lot of windows in my house because I have a mansion. And, you know, (laughs) going through all of this. The way he tells the story is fascinating, by the way. But um, is it in his book that you read? Yeah, it's in his book. But there's been other interviews you can see. Um, I'll link them uh, in the show notes. But he ends up going back outside. He's holding his shotgun The police see him, they've arrived now, and tell him to put down a shotgun. So they talk to him, ask him what's happened, and David says he doesn't know who did this. He says, someone broke in my house, gives a description, but doesn't say, hey, it's Skippy. Someone he knew was there with him and were like, hey, if you know something, you need to say it. But he knew this was going to ruin the guy's life forever. That this wasn't him, this was, you know, a terrible thing, but he will go to prison and this is it for him. He's just hoping like, I don't know, he's still not that long after he's woken up. I don't think everything's, you know. Yeah, maybe he's in shock. For sure. Or Skippy had a lot of dirt on him. I don't know which one it is. Interesting. Yeah. So he gives the description and the officers are basically like, hey, you said that he told you that he got called, you know, because of the alarms, like. You had to know who this person is. not random. Yeah. Right. So he finally says, yeah, it's my assistant. It's Skippy. So they leave. They search for him for hours. He's left the property. Officers are looking everywhere for him. They end up finding him later in the day, parked in a car. He's passed out. He's taken 100 Tylenol PMs. That's what David Spey had said. I have no idea if that's an accurate number. He apparently has been calling friends all day and making what police described as suicide calls, kind of just telling people it was over. So he's taken to the hospital. They pump his stomach. And David, of course, is completely shaken up. And he, you know, is talking to police, talking to friends, and he decides not to press charges. He said, there's no way this guy he's known for all these years, you know, wanted to hurt me something was happening there was something bigger going on so he's quoted as saying and this is like very soon after this happened happened quote david malloy was a good friend of mine for five years i believe he's a good person who is obviously mentally troubled right now i can only hope that he seeks the help he needs to get well my heart goes out to him end quote so whatever you think about david spade i actually think that's like incredibly right incredibly gracious he could go after this guy get him in prison forever yeah Officers later told David that they believed that Skippy's entire plan was to break in the house, take David's shotgun, because 
he was the only person that knew David kept it under his bed, Mm -hmm. shoot him and shoot himself. And David waking up throws a wrench in this plan, obviously. Right, right. right. Skippy later claimed that he was on a lot of cocaine that day or had taken a lot of cocaine. And his lawyer claimed he was in a cocaine-induced psychosis, which was the only motive they could find for why he'd want to kill his boss and his friend. It doesn't make any sense. Since then, though, David's moved on from this incident. He, I read something that says, like, he still locks the doors when he goes to the bathroom, locks, you know, oh my gosh, how do you sure. not? Skippy requested, and the courts actually allowed him to write a letter of apology to David. You know, we weren't privy to what that actually said. And he was sentenced to five years probation and 480 hours of community service for assault. Mm. And imagine, though, if David pressed charges, you could have attempted murder. You could have oh, yeah. all kinds of stuff. They dropped charges, and he just would not pursue it. He said, I wanted it to be over with. I wanted him to get help. This was not my friend. Wow. Something was wrong. Again, so generous. And I, this drug-induced thing, I get that the drugs might have compelled him to physically act something out that he might not have otherwise in a right. sober state. But I feel like there has to be some deep seated resentment, jealousy. Yeah. Um, you know, like he's not making it and it's just like, he won't accept that anymore. And it just yeah. seems like he got himself into a place where the he combination could go through with that. Yeah. It mm-hmm. has to be, I don't think it was just so random. Yeah. No. It yeah. Has no. To be years of something building. Right. Right. And that Kevin Nealon thing just pushed him over the edge but yeah it's it's i don't know it's it's really sad and it's so sad and how do you get another assistant after that like the interview process must really change <laughs> so uh i saw like several clips of him being interviewed for this and one was anthony jeselnik and he was like hey uh david how do you vet your uh first question how do you vet your assistants he was yes. like not very well <laughs> yeah i mean what do you like how would you change the process moving forward to make sure that doesn't happen again he Jeez. says now he picks very small people that are smaller than him or people he can take on that's like his honestly so. I mean, it's not even a joke. No, I know. But that's where he's like, I, I pick the ones that I can take on. I'm like, no, that actually makes a lot of sense. Wow. Yeah. So since the incident, David's really moved on. He's kept himself very busy. He made a return to TV back in 2005 with the Showbiz Show with David Spade. It was on Comedy Central, three oh, okay. seasons. I loved it. Um, it's sort of like very familiar to his old uh, time on doing Spade in America and the Hollywood Minute. And then in 2019, he hosted Lights Out with David Spade. Did you hear about that? I heard about that. Okay. I have really not followed his career. I haven't watched it. I know. I loved it. It's very him doing his little quirky monologue. Sometimes the guests are like interjecting into his monologue, which was really funny. Okay. And it was very uh, Chelsea lately, how they had like the round table and stuff. Mm-hmm. So sometimes really funny people would be on there and sometimes people's publicists would put them on there and you could tell the difference between Uh a funny person and somebody here to, you know, promote Promote Sharknado 4. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, unfortunately, though, in March of 2020, it was shut down for failure to pay the electricity bills. Just kidding. It was COVID. (laughs) I was like, oh, lights out. That's a fun pun. Oh, I didn't even mean to do that. That's poetic. (laughs) Nice. So Comedy Central didn't bring it back, which to me was so dumb. Uh, It didn't seem like it would be very expensive to produce that show. Right, Um, right. But before it was gone, he had a really amazing special that was a little different than others. He ended up having a few of the Weekend Update hosts on for a reunion. Um, This got some press whenever it happened. It was Kevin Nealon, Dennis Miller, and Norm MacDonald. Fun. Yeah, so they talked and reminisced about their time on Weekend Update. The sad thing is, you know, Norm, Norm McDonald passed away this week, and I watched this and Googled Norm McDonald sick because he did not look very well. It was so sad. I was like, something's wrong. Oh. And nothing. There's nothing on the internet. And that's because he didn't ever share with anyone that he was sick, which is... Yeah, I kept that so private. Mind-blowing to me. And I have been all in my feels about Norm Macdonald dying, by the way. I, uh, oh. yeah, my husband was like, I don't know if you'll grieve this much for me as you have for Norm Macdonald. 
And honestly, if my husband had made some of my favorite interview clips of all time and put them on YouTube, maybe I would. (laughs) Right. So that's on him. Totally. Like, it's just bringing up a lot of feelings, like, from when Chris Farley died. Because, like, you really connected with their work and you're, yeah, I get it. I'm going through some things. Yeah. But no, like, you know how people, whenever somebody dies a celebrity, it's like, RIP this person. I'm like, I saw you do that last week, too. You didn't know the person. You didn't care. And there's, like, a grief group that does this kind of thing that yes makes me crazy. Um, I mean, I shouldn't, but it bothers me. He's one for me that, like, I loved him, but I didn't – I would watch his YouTube clips. He was yeah. very funny. He had an interview with um, Bob – Oh, gosh, I can't remember his name. Super Dave. He was on Arrested Development, and he passed away two years ago. And I watched all – like, that's how I kind of got in a rabbit hole. If you're um, grieving the loss of Norm Macdonald this week, I can send you as many clips as you want. I've gone down a total rabbit hole of watching them, and it's been super fun. But anyway, I like the connection of David Spade and Norm Macdonald this week. Yeah, that's timely. I'm about tired of us doing timely things because I think – I don't want to – I don't know what's happening. We did – accidentally did Rachel you could tell in 9-11 I know we've had some other ones that have been like the day of or crazy I know I know I know we need to be careful we clearly wield more power than we realized I so know. um maybe we should start like manifesting things to happen through our episodes yeah. that we want to happen I know this is probably the end of my doucheness uh phase for a while I think he's douche adjacent I don't think Ooh. David Spade, Spade. He okay. is a ladies' man. He like has really? dated Lara Flynn Boyle, Julie Bowen. Um, this this these ring bells. I can see pictures of these in in like tabloids and magazines. I think he's also like a lot of the celebrities or the um, the comics that came out of SNL. Like known for having a good time. Like I'm yes. sure his assistant wasn't the only one who took part in some recreational activities. Yes. Um, and he had said as much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm not surprised that he, he partied and had some pretty amazing women on his arm. His arm. Is that the word you were going for? <laughs> totally. Feels like you could have Definitely. been suggesting something else. <laughs> um, but that's crazy. I don't know where I was because I bet this was kind of big news. <laughs> Honestly, I, totally I don't have a it. clue about it. I had no idea until a couple of years ago. And then I found okay. so much on it that like huh. everybody I would ask, I'm like, have you heard this story? And I, my husband, I asked and he was like, yeah. And he's like, wait, no, I heard it whenever you were painting the room and listening to the. Oh, that's the so thing. funny. It yeah. is interesting, though, like which of these stories really breaks through and everybody hears and which kind of just don't for some reason. I don't know. Right. It's- that yeah, comes up here totally. a lot. Like, if you don't ha- hear it whenever it happens, like it's never going to be on your radar. So Totally. Yeah. Wow. Who knew? Uh, lots of people. Um, <laughs> Hopefully. I hope I'm two not. two years ago. No, you're not the only one. You're not the only one. I promise. Anyone I have asked about this in recent times was like, I had no idea. So I think okay. you're in good company. Rebecca, do you have any clues for the next episode? I certainly do. I just think they might really suck. Wow. We are really (laughs) selling ourselves today. I had a little breakdown over my episode and now you're suck. So let's go ahead. How are we going to get people to listen next week? episode is fantastic. I just, the the obvious clues are just too obvious. Sure. And I've only just started the research, so I don't know what the like cool nuanced, just next level tier ones would be. So here we go. Clue number one, journey. Clue number two, pay-per-view. Clue number three, oasis. Ooh, those are really good clues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I do think they're they're compelling. It's going to be a great episode. <laughs> it's going to be a great episode. Rolling it back. Um, but uh, it will be an interesting one. It will. It definitely will be. Yeah. Um, I know you have not been well, and I know you've been deep in research, but have you watched any good TV that you want me to guess? Yes, of course. I'm always okay. watching something. Um, so mine, you'll be able to guess. This is not a new show. Oh, okay. do you know what show I – real quick. I abandoned a show, Nine Perfect Strangers. We're, yeah, oh, we talked me about too. this. Did not like it at all. Couldn't even okay. get through the first episode. Oh, really? I made it through like – I'm going to end up finishing it. You I know I am. I only have one episode left. such a finisher. Left. I am such a quitter. I'm like, Mm-mm. I'm not – 
disengaging. Yes. <laughs> so we say I'm not engaged, but I'll just disengage. I just, I have no loyalty to a show. I just want it to get better, but I did that with clickbait and it got nowhere. But thank you all for the comments that we've gotten this week the about other clickbait conversation. Clickbait. Yeah. Lots of people hate it. Is a bubbling. Yeah. Yeah. Nine Perfect Strangers was not good. It felt like one of those books that was written to be a TV show. Right. And I just, I didn't like it. Mm -mm. And why can't Nicole Kidman just have an Australian accent? Just Or why don't they just cast a Russian American actor? (laughs) Okay. Well, there, that's the more obvious answer. If the character had to be Russian, like why does she have to do it? Why does she, yeah, there's just a lot of questions I have. But Melissa McCartney, the parts, McCarthy, the parts that she was in, I thought were really funny. So yeah, she's really good. She's that's the really, redeemable really, part. really good. Um, yeah. But it wasn't enough to save it for me. So no, I agree. But I'll finish. Um, okay, so my three clues this is an older show, but I'm going to just okay. give you three names Selena, Sue, and Gary on HBO. Selena, Sue, and Gary on HBO. It's a comedy. It's done. It's done? Like, how old? I think it ended, like, two years ago. Selena Gomez wasn't on anything on HBO. No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Democracy. Selena. Oh, oh, oh. Veep? Yeah. I'm watching yes. Veep again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've never finished Veep. I do like it. I don't know why I keep tapering off. I will go back. I will go there back. is an episode on Veep called Mother. It's in the fourth season. And I know okay. this because it's like my comfort episode. No, so whenever, I love those. Yeah. Well, it's messed up, though. It's like <laughs> her mom passes away, which isn't giving anything away. But it's the comedic stuff that happens throughout that and how she's just such a narcissist and everything's about her. Like, it, it is absolutely hilarious. There's a Tim McGraw song that plays in there that she just hates. Oh, it's just so good. I'm good. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It brings me so much joy. So that's like whenever I know like how my mental health is doing, like how quickly when you I, reach for it. <laughs> that whenever I'm there, I'm like, I might need to readjust this medicine. <laughs> Your therapist is like, have you gone to season four of Veep yet, though, Melissa? Yeah. I need to know if it's a crisis call. I'm in season five now, so I'm, I'm getting better. I'm, I'm doing okay. better. But I love that. It's such a fun uh, watch. It's very, very fast. If it's you very it. fast. Lots very of language, uh, but very, very, very funny. I agree. I agree. I got to go back to that. Um, I have a really unsatisfactory answer for this, too. My clues. This is not my week to shine. I'm telling you, I felt like I wasn't there for you for your story because I hadn't seen all these movies. No, you were fine. Um, I just I really enjoyed hearing the story, but I didn't participate in a way that I would like. So I watched so much that isn't, you know, typically it was just a lot of Bravo. And so I started a lot of shows and I stopped a lot of shows. And this is one of them. I had high hopes for it. I won't say anymore. We can talk about it after. But here's the clue. I don't think you'll get it. It's kind of obscure. It's British. I watched it on Acorn. Okay. And here's some clues. Uh, One was British. Um, Staircase, murder mystery. Or mystery, actually, just mystery. I don't have any idea. Yeah, you wouldn't. It's very new on Acorn. And I'm like, this seems like just the kind of like fall spooky season coming show I want to watch. It's called Finding Alice on Acorn. I am going to give it one more episode because I'm intrigued. So this woman moves into this brand new house that her husband designed. I think he's an architect. They have one daughter and he dies like the first night they move in. She wakes up and he'd fallen down the stairs, a la the staircase, the true right. dock. And I definitely think they're they're tongue in cheeking it a little okay. based on that real documentary and that real case. But it's set in Britain and it's like one of those British style comedies where it's like someone dies and it's super sad, but it's also kind of funny. Right. But it's moving in a weird way that I didn't expect, but basically everybody's like, wait, did the wife do it? And they're starting to suspect her, but it, but she doesn't seem to have done it, but I don't know. And I'm going to give it one more try because I like the actor. It's like, I like the concept. It just didn't hook me. And I feel like all I did was quit shows this week. Start and stop, start and stop, start. But let me tell you, you aren't still wondering what's going to happen on the stupid Nine Perfect Strangers, even though you don't even care. Again, that's I'm true. Hoping for all of them to just it does be done. not keep me up at night at all. No, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's why I didn't start Emily in Paris because so many people hated it. I was like, I'll have to finish it. Yeah, <laughs> and that will die, be time I'll never get back. Yeah. That was so fun when everyone was just actively roasting that show. That I was like it. kind of a fun 
experience. It was. I did listen to Watch What Crappens do a review of the first I did episode. too. I didn't even watch it and I listened to them and it was blissful entertainment Absolutely. even without having seen it because they can do no wrong. But um, yes. yeah, so I'll give it one more try and let you know if I recommend it. Right now I would say like a meh. So maybe wait. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Yeah. That sounds good. Cool. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for doing this. We should do this again in two weeks. That sounds like a plan. I'm going to go get ready for the next episode. This was great. And thanks, everybody, for listening. You can follow us at Criminality Show across all platforms. That's what those are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can watch this on YouTube. Hello, if you're watching us on YouTube. And um, Melissa has a show every Tuesday called Moms and Murder. You can find her there. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, Rebecca has a show called Dialogue that you can find every Wednesday. And she just interviewed the people who did... uh, the Lula Rich documentary. That's what I should have said. I loved that. That was great. We should have talked about that because we both watched it. And we both loved it. What a great, fun series. So fun. And I here's my question. How do people keep agreeing to do these documentaries whenever it doesn't paint them in a great light? Well, I don't. And it's fine if you didn't. I don't know if you listened to my interview, but I asked them, I'm like, how did you get access? How did you convince Mark and Dion to sit down and tell the story? And they were like, we just told them we're going to tell this story. You want to be in it or not? Like we're making it with or without you. Wouldn't you want your perspective shared? And I think they thought it was going to be like a really fun fluff piece or something. (laughs) Because I I don't know why else they would they would do that. Um, But I'm so glad they did. Yeah, that happens a lot, though. People were like, why would you be a part of this? But and I guess that is why you'd want your side to be on there. Yeah, I think there's also some like denial and disconnect of like wrongdoing or how this will be perceived because right. they think surely like the good we're doing and the positive stuff will outweigh any like little noisy, pestering, nagging problems. Yeah. And it just so didn't play out like that, which mm-hmm. is awesome to watch. Um, but yeah, that was a good doc. Yeah, definitely watch that if you haven't. It's on Amazon Prime, right? Amazon Prime. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. And listen to Rebecca's interview with the uh, directors. Yeah. Yeah. They're really cool. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Rebecca. See you guys in two weeks.